Welcome back. I hope everyone's had a wonderful week. Girls, I love you and I hope you're doing well. Today we're going to be doing something that I've never done before. And that's taking and combining two messages or two teachings into one. The reason for that is a lot of times people can get kind of lost or confused. Especially when you take uh, a story and you apply it one way. And then turn around and use the very exact same story a little later on and apply it a different way. People are like, hold on now. Last time you said it was this way and this is what it said and this is what it meant. Now you're saying it's this way and this is what it is and this is what it means. I mean, which is it? Which is right? I don't want to do that. So I thought it best to combine them together uh, of course, yes, there's a lot of scripture. And no, we're not going to be able to go as in-depth in it as I'd like to. But hopefully it'll shine a light, uh, at least enough of a light to where uh, it'll give you something to think about. And, you know, I want you to try to get as much out of my videos as you can. I will try to go as in-depth as I can. But if you have any questions, feel free to drop me a line, uh, leave a comment down below. I'll be more than happy to, to try to explain it further to you. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and let's go to Malachi chapter 2. By the time we get to the end, you're going to understand what I mean by forgotten miracles when your blessings become a curse. So, Malachi chapter 2, verse 2 says, if you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. Now, there's a reason why I read that scripture first. Because we're going to see through these stories I'm going to share with you that in each case, these people received a miracle. In each case, these people were blessed. As well, uh, these people, in each case, their blessings became a curse. Let's look at Hezekiah. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 38. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Okay, well, that kind of backs up the the whole statement, sick unto death, doesn't it? Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. I don't know about you, but I mean, I'd be doing the same thing here. And he said, remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thine sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. Okay, well, you know, the atmosphere has changed now. I mean, just a moment ago, he, 
he's sitting here sick unto death. He's going to die. And now the Lord's saying, nah, -uh, not today. You know what? Change my mind. You're going you're gonna to have another 15 years. I mean, how much better can it get? And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. In other words, the Lord's saying, not only will I add 15 years to your life, but I'm going to fight your battles for you. I'm going to be your bodyguard, so to speak. You're going to have peace. And if anybody's crazy enough to try to come against you, they're going to have to go through me first. I've gone before you. I will fight your battles. I will protect you. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees by which degrees it was gone down. Okay? There you go. There's your miracle. Now, one of the things I can't help but notice here, people always want to talk about how smart they are, how they know so much, all the degrees they have. People, listen, just watch. One day, uh, we're going we're gonna to invent time travel. Okay, evidently these people are lost and going to hell. They haven't never read their Bible. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sun dial of Ahaz 10 degrees backward. Went back in time. God's already invented time travel. Okay? So, man can try to uh, create it and, 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 and place his label on it all he wants to. But right here we see uh, God's already went 10 degrees back in time. Now, it looks like things is going pretty well for Hezekiah, right? I mean, he, he he's not going to die. God's going to protect him. And to show him that he means business and his word is true, that he will do what he promised to do, he's going to turn the sundial back 10 degrees. Let's see how he fares. Look with me at Isaiah 39 verses... One through seven. At that time, Meredith Baladin, the son of Baladin, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered. Okay, so it couldn't have been uh, that much time that has passed since the Lord did this and uh, this other king of Babylon sent a letter and a gift to him. Uh, but it says, And Hezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things. Remember that word precious. Precious things. The silver the, and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasures. Remember treasures. That's going to become important too. There was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto king Hezekiah, and said unto him, What said these men, and from whence came they unto thee. And Hezekiah said, They are come to me from a far country, even from Babylon. Then said he, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All that is in my house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures, nothing I hold dear, nothing I hold sacred. Nothing that I perceive to be as valuable. Nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, 
hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. Nothing, nothing. And the sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So you see, he was blessed, which I consider the the first part of the miracle, which was the healing, the God giving, but you can also define it as a blessing. But he, he was healed from the sickness. God defended him, his city, against the enemy. He turned back time for him to show him as a sign to prove to him that God was faithful and God was true. And what happened? Well, somebody sent him a present, made him feel good. Oh, look at, look at that. They care about me. I don't know who these people are. I don't know even know where this place is. But evidently, I must be mightier and greater than I thought I was because they've heard about me and they're concerned about me. That's just so sweet. And then he comes and he's like, I'm going to show off a little bit. And he starts showing them all the gold and, and silver and things in his house. All the armor, his his his, his mighty army. Um, as if to say, look at me. Look at all that I have. Look at all I've accomplished. Look at how great and powerful and wealthy I am. I did this. Okay? Remember what we read in Malachi 2? If ye will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, Hezekiah didn't give glory to his name. Hezekiah gave glory unto himself. And he didn't acknowledge God in any of it. And it talked about the, 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 the precious things. Um, it talked about uh, out of all his treasures, the things that were most valuable, the things that meant the most to him, and the things that he he ascertained those those words to those titles to were worldly things, material things, earthly things, and not God, not the spiritual things, not the miracles and the blessings he received. He 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 loved the gift more than the giver, and then he just took it and he was just disrespectful. He was ungrateful, unthankful. And so, as we've seen, his blessing became a curse. He forgot about the miracle that God had performed for him. Not just in the healing, not just in the protection, not just in, 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 in turning back time, but the miracle of love. He forgot about the miracle only thought about himself, was prideful, arrogant, and so his blessing became a curse. So now you can kind of see where I'm coming from. Forgotten miracles when your blessings become a curse. Okay? Now, let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 3, and I want to read verses 3 through 14. And it says, And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon the altar. And Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask 
what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto my servant David, my father, great mercy. According as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept from him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord, my God, Thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? Okay. He made a request. I've, I've shared this with you before. Uh, in the Old Testament, anytime God uh, uh, would go to anyone in, like in a dream, he would always ask them for something or ask them to do something. But in this case, uh, he went to... Uh, Solomon and said, what would you like for me to do for you? Basically, he opened up a, a buffet of blessings and said, you know, pick whatever you want. Just name it and it's yours. You know, uh, to me, right here is, 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 is uh, where we start really getting into the miracle. Because it says that he brought uh, a, a thousand uh, burnt offerings uh, to be sacrificed unto the Lord. He went way above and beyond what was expected of him to do. Uh, so the first miracle is uh, basically, uh, not only did he get the attention of all of those in heaven, he got the attention of God. So much so that God was like, would you look at that? Oh my goodness, little old Solomon. And he goes to him in a dream and he says, hey man, you know, I appreciate what you did. Uh, what can I do for you? And so when he made a request for understanding heart to judge the people, it was something he was going to receive, yes, but he was asking this on behalf of the good of the people. And God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for long life, or for riches, or for thyself, nor hath asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thy self-understanding to the son judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk then I will lengthen thy days. Okay? Now, here again, I mean, we, we see miracles. We see we see a blessing. I mean, God, God's going to give him uh, an understanding heart to be able to judge, to, 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 to discern between good and bad. He's going to be able to help all these people. Um, you know, he, received, he, he basically received a, a miracle and a blessing. Because what did we just read? There'll never be anyone wiser before, here, now in the present, or in the future, who is wiser than you. Smartest man who ever walked on the face of the earth. I mean, I, I think that's a miracle. I mean, he didn't have it. And all of a sudden, poof, now he does. Uh, that's a miracle. 
And the blessing is that God uh, was pleased with him enough to go above and beyond what he asked for and give him that which he didn't ask for. Okay? Now, let's see how he handles the situation. Let's see how he does. Okay? Turn with me. We're still in 1 Kings. Turn with me to um, chapter 11. And I want to read verses 1 through 11. It says, there was some time that has gone by now. Keep that in mind. Don't know how much time, but there has been some time that has passed. And verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 1 says, But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Okay, we all know right there, that's trouble with a capital T. And I have to be honest, folks, I'm not trying to, I guess, say this in a bad way, but you think Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, I mean, you'd think he'd be able to see this coming, but, you know, even with all that wisdom, you know, none of us are still in a position to, to think or perceive ourselves as being perfect. I mean, we all make mistakes. But I just think that whenever I hear the word, the wisest ever, to judge, to discern good from bad, I mean, that's what he was the wisest in regards to, you would think he'd be able to see this coming. It's just an observation of mine. Verse 2. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. So everybody knew this. They knew what God commanded, but it says Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, a thousand women. Oh my gosh. Today's world, we can't deal with one, uh, how in the world he put up with a thousand women. Do you see where I'm coming from? I mean, how he, he didn't see this coming. I don't understand it because I know it's a thing for them to have more than one wife back then, but a thousand. And isn't it, isn't it ironic that he has a, a thousand women, combined total, wives and concubines, and it was also a thousand of the, the, the cattle that he brought to be sacrificed. You think that's just a coincidence? I don't know. Something worth looking into. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart from other gods and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Well, I mean, you, you call them horrible names like that. All you need is a whipped cream on top of the pie and you're ready to eat, folks. I, I don't know. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Then Solomon did build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem and for Molech, 
the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon. I can imagine. Because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And he commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and give it to thy servant. Received a miracle, received a blessing, but he forgot the miracle. He forgot the commandments of God. He 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 forgot the uh, 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 about how wonderful the blessings of having uh, this ability to to judge and discern uh, good and bad between people and keeping keeping peace within his kingdom. His blessing became a curse. And, you know, in the end, honestly, I mean, think about it, folks. What good did it do him? I don't know how much time had passed here. I really don't. But, you know, I would think that he would live, you know, remotely the same length of time as most people back in that day would. I'm sure when he left this this earth, uh, I'm sure that he could have lived a lot longer. I'm sure that uh, God could have used him in, in, in many mighty and great ways, but he didn't walk uh, in the ways of his father David. He he didn't keep his commandments. He, he, he went after the very thing God told him not to go after. He started worshiping other gods. They turned his heart from God to other gods false gods, which God had already pretty much prophesied and told him what happened. It's a shame when all we can think about is how much we want the presence of God, the love of God, how we uh, want to live a life where God's in control and uh, we're just pretty much on autopilot. But yet, when we when we get in that position or are headed in that position, we tend to forget about the past uh, miracles that the Lord has, has provided or shown us. And then we pray for something and it doesn't necessarily happen right away. And so then we get angry. And when we get angry, what well, we do, we always want to blame somebody and we either end up blaming the devil or blaming God. It's funny. We always blame somebody, but we never blame ourselves. And these cases so far, they had nobody to blame but themselves. They did this. Nobody else did it. They did it. And they put themselves in this position. They brought this on themselves because they forgot the miracle and the blessing became a curse. Folks, one of the greatest weapons uh, the enemy has is uh, the weapon of, of deceit. You'd be surprised at how easily people are deceived. I also heard um, a pastor when I was younger. I can't remember exactly what he was preaching about, but uh, he was talking about the devil. So it, it, it had to be something, you know, about hell and damnation and sin, something, you know. And he made a statement. And he said, the greatest trick the devil ever did 
was proven that he didn't exist. Well, like I said, I mean, I'm young. I, I didn't really comprehend it, didn't understand it, didn't make no sense. I thought he was just nuts. But, you know, uh, I got to thinking about it. And, you know, actually, it was pretty smart. Because it was actually a, a prophecy. The greatest trick the devil ever did was to prove that he didn't exist. Look at the world today, folks. Nobody believes he exists. Nobody believes the end's coming. Nobody believes it's important to, to, to seek out, search out, to find God. Um, that's what's happened. We are now living in a society with this new generation coming up, these millennials, um, there's, they're, they're going to be the start of the end of it all. Um, who, who are just like the people we read about, so selfish, so ungrateful, um, unthankful, and it's all about them. And, and they don't care about God and, and they don't think the devil's real and they don't think that they're going to go to hell when they die. And so technically, uh, yeah, it was a prophecy because that's what we're living in. Here today in this time. Turn with me to Mark chapter 6. My goodness, at the bookmarks. All right, Mark chapter 6. I want to read 45 through 52. It says, and this is. All these I'm about to read to you are pertaining to when Jesus fed uh, the 5,000, the 4,000, okay? This is right after that. And straight away, he commanded his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto the city while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he came, uh, uh, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed them by. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. Immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up into, uh, unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were so amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered why. The next verse tells you why. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves. For their heart was hardened. We forget our miracles because of this world, things we go through, the lifestyle we live. Um, just like in this storm with Peter and the disciples, they were so focused on it, they, 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 they totally forgot all about the miracle they just witnessed. Didn't have enough food to feed those people, but Jesus blessed and broke the bread. And when he did, not only did he feed the people and the people got full, but they took up extra. There was an overflow. That's what happens when God blesses us. God doesn't just give us enough. He gives us overflow. Okay? One thing uh, I've been thinking about this week is how uh, the greatest blessings come from the mightiest and most painful breakings. So if God is breaking you, if God is allowing you to be broke, it's because he's going to bless you. So 
you know, don't look at your breaking as a form of torture or punishment uh, in any way, any sort of condemnation. Uh, it is the Lord's way of preparing you, of exalting you, lifting you up, actually, to a higher level, a new plateau with him and your relationship with him. You have to uh, allow God to work and to move and to do things in his own time. When you give it to God, don't go back and try to pick it up. In this case here, they thought they had saw a ghost. They, 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 they were not only scared of the storm, I mean, the way the scripture puts it, it's almost like they think that when they see the Lord walking on the water, he's like the Grim Reaper or something. And so they're definitely going to die now. And he gets in and he calms the, the sea. Um, I believe it's Luke. It says, uh, they even ask, you know, what man is this that even the winds and, 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 and the, the seas obey him? Um, all these miracles happening right in front of them. And as soon as they happen, they're forgetting one right after another. Okay? Look with me at uh, Matthew 15, 7 through 9. Okay? Now, let me see here. 16. Now go with me first uh, to, to Matthew 16, 5 through 12. I'm going to show you one way that we forget about the miracles and how our blessings turn into curses today. Because we're looking at the wrong thing, for the wrong thing, to the wrong thing, for these blessings. Okay, and it explains it so crystal clear right here. So please listen. And when his disciples will come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves saying, is it because we have taken no bread? We didn't buy no bread. I thought you was going to buy the bread. No, I told you to grab a loaf. No, no, that's your job. You done got the Lord mad. Now look what you done gone did. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because you have brought no bread? What? Are you nuts? Do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up? He reminded them of the miracles. How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning actual physical bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Oh, then understood they how that he bade them not Beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Okay, continue that thought. Uh, back to uh, Matthew 15, verse 7 through 9. Jesus is having a, a discussion here where he sums it all up and says, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. 
but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Folks, how many times have I told you that in church, you're not, uh, you're not, you're not uh, listening to the word of God. You're not being taught the truth of God's word. You're being taught what they learn from man, man's ways, the world's ways, man's wisdom, the world's wisdom, man's understanding, the world's understanding, uh, whatever the district to whatever denomination you belong to, uh, whatever their rules, the church's doctrine, their guidelines say you have to uh, confine yourself to. We don't talk about this. We don't talk about that. Well, why? It's in the Bible. Yeah, but we just don't believe that. So you have a problem believing God's word, which means you don't trust all of God's word, which means maybe you just don't have the kind of relationship with God that you should especially someone who's going to stand up in that pulpit and going to teach. But you go like sheep being led to the slaughter every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and you sit there and you listen. And you take what they say as if it was God himself speaking it. And you apply it to your life. And then when things don't go wrong, you don't know what to do. They don't teach you. They don't edify you. They don't lift you up. Church is not for saved people. Churches for lost people. Remember the scripture I shared with you in the last video? It pleased God. That word pleased doesn't mean what you automatically assume it means. That word pleased means that he was astonished. He was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. You know, at the foolishness, excuse me, at the foolishness of preaching to them that believe. Why? Because there's no reason to teach to those that believe they have the spirit of God. They have the truth of God. Okay? They go out here and they make disciples of every nation. They preach to every nation, every tongue, every kindred. The people that are in church are the ones who are lost. And when they get saved, then, you know, they prepare themselves and Maybe they'll have a mentor or somebody that can kind of help lead them and guide them along the way. But then uh, as they grow in instruction and understanding, then they go out themselves as well and do the same thing. It's like a revolving door effect. Church was never meant for saved people. But people go. Why? Because just like Hezekiah, we want to lift ourselves up. Look at all I got. Look at what I do. I tell you what, they can't nobody run this nursery program better than I do. I tell you what, the people that come and sit in on my Sunday school lessons, I, buddy, uh, when they leave, they, they've learned something. You know, maybe they do. I hope so. But it's all about look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. No wonder the millennials are the way they are. That's why they got that mentality. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Do I have to? I'd rather not. I'll talk to you, but I'd rather do it looking at something else because it just, when I look at you, I, I just see the direction you're headed and it just breaks my heart. Folks, we have always got to never let things uh, invade our hearts, our minds, and our life that allow us to take our focus off of the miracles to a point where we forget all that God has done. If we remember all that God has done, we would actually go to church and praise him for all that he has done and not go to church just like any other day of the week and pray and ask him, what have you done for me lately? Why can't you do this for me now? That's what we do. That's who we are. That's how we live. That's how we act. Shameful, ain't it? I know. It's a wonder any of us walk around with our heads up. And then when God does bless us, we try to show it off. We try to take what God did and make it ours. We try to strip God of all the glory, his holiness, his righteousness, his power, his authority, by claiming it 
as I did this and I did that and because I got the job, because I went to school and got the education. You know, this is what I did. And God's like, no, you didn't. I did that. And that hurts God. We all know what it's like to be hurt. So some of us go through things where we hurt more deeply uh, than others. Maybe it's a, a marriage breakup. Maybe it's a death of a loved one or something. We know what hurt and pain is. Well, that's how God feels. When, when, we, when we try to take away from him that which never belonged to us to start with. So our blessings become a curse. Forgotten miracles when your blessings become a curse. See how it all comes together? I, there's so much more. You guys know me. There's so much more I'd love to say, but, you know, uh, I can see by the time that uh, this thing is fixing to stop on me. So I'm going to have to get off of here. Uh, I love you guys. Feel free to leave a comment, leave a like. I'll be working on the uh, next video. Not sure uh, how I'm going to come at it yet, but it's going to be about baptism. Uh, this is one of the request. So you guys have a wonderful day. Girls, I love you. Until next time, you two, God be with you.